Okay, here we go. This is a special edition of Late Night Health. Uh, we're going to spend some time on this episode with Rose McGowan. Now, Rose is an actor, an activist, producer, director, and musician. And we're going to spend uh, some time with her and find out what makes her tick. That's the, the idea. Uh, Rose, thanks for joining us. Let's talk about living in 2020 right now mm -hmm. uh, with COVID. Uh, first of all, I mean, uh, people need things to do. And what I did the other day was when I got the album, your album, Planet Planet Nine, I, uh, I listened to it. I did nothing else. I found it, yes, I found it relaxing and stimulating. Um, um, my wife likes guided meditation. I don't. Uh, and, but I found it very, very calming. Thank what you. motivated you to do Planet Nine? Well, it's very specifically what you just said. Um, I was going through a very horrible time in my life. Uh, later, that became very public news, obviously, from between 2017 to like 2000, till like uh, two months ago, basically, right, with right. the trial and the conviction of Harvey Weinstein. Um, but that, preceding that, when I was 10 years old, I moved to America. And I got sent from a hippie commune in Italy to a military school in Washington, D.C., uh, Washington State. And I was like, eh. it, 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 it was really hardcore culture shock. And the food, the difference between Tuscan food and then American food in the 80s, in the mid 80s, I was like, eh. oh. someone took me to Denny's and I got so excited. So I saw a plate of spaghetti on the picture and I ate it. I was like, what? And, and you worked at a McDonald's? Never. That's not true. No? My oh. sister did. Oh, okay. I worked at a funeral home. That's the only job I've had besides Hollywood is I worked at, I liked it very much. I found it quite peaceful. Um, I was just a strange 14 year old. I found the dead a lot less scary than the living at that point in my life. Um, but when I was 10 and going through a big culture shock, I decided that I didn't really like the world or planet I was on. And I decided to create my own with my mind kind of like an imaginary friend. But this orb would come out of the ceiling at school and whatever people were yelling at me and calling me freak or weird because I was from somewhere else and didn't speak English, whatever, um, I would just like stare at them and smile because it didn't matter because I had this orb around me. And I would just sit and I would space out and wonder what sound frequencies were on this planet, what the colors and lights were like. My father was a great artist and, I, and he taught me how to see color in a really unique way, I think and to see art kind of everywhere, uh, in nature and, and, and everywhere. And as we do, we forget about, about our invisible best friend, right? We forget that. But I've always, in times of deep stress, um, kind of envisioned circles around me, uh, like kind of protection zones. And then six years ago, astronomers found Planet Nine. It's when they made Pluto not a planet. And I don't know how I jumped in logic to this, but I was like, I need to make songs for my planet, clearly. <laughs> and just having the thought kind of manifested people in my life, like person after person, because I had no idea. I'd only worked in Hollywood. I didn't know how to make an album. I did not know. I'd done like three songs on soundtracks that were covers. And so I set about, I found this French electronic duo. I had shot them for their album cover. And then I heard their music and I was like, most electronic music, I like some of it, but some of it's too hard for me. And other times it just feels cold. It leaves me cold, right? Mm -hmm. But I thought, what if you can combine, hold on, my dog's trying to get on the bed. One second. It, okay, no problem. This is oh, how cute. So I set about making music with these guys. And I said, do you have a singer? Do you have anything? And they said, no. And I was like, can I buy your, buy your um, music? Can I have it for myself? And they said, sure. So I, and, I, and then from there, I was introduced to a great producer uh, in Biarritz and another great producer that we recorded in El Paso of all places. And I just, having no idea how to do it, I would literally just meet the next person at the next right step. And that's just kind of how I've approached life. But I really appro approach this project very organically and holistically. And it had to have my voice because for so many years, I was an actress and I wasn't saying things that I was thinking. I was saying things somebody else was thinking. And I spent more of my life for 22 years being other people than I got to be myself. And to grow up 
and have to become an adult and a woman or a human and figure out what's what while you're in Hollywood and kind of a weird cult um, of fame and, and you have to hire people to protect you from regular citizens because they're dangerous, you know, all this crazy stuff. It really served to isolate me. I have a track on the album called Lonely House and I am the Lonely House. And I think, you know, and I start that with, are you lonely on your planet? Are you lonely on the fringe? And I, I think we all have that lonely house inside of us, that one house with the one light on the hill. You know that one of the biggest problems facing Americans, and especially now, and I would think around the world, because of the COVID-19, uh, the stay at home and being isolated. I mean, I'm going nuts. I got to tell you. Are you by, but yeah, it's hard. And it's, we can't travel bad. outside. We yeah. can't travel. And just the idea that like we fundamentally, like people that are like, I can escape. There's nowhere to escape to. No. I mean, this, is an escape, this is an escape for me. You're like the first person I've talked to other than saying hello to my wife today. My, my question is, or my statement is that even in a city of, uh, there was a TV show in a city of 7 million and it was about New York. And I think they have a lot more people there now. My point is that even with all those people, people can be lonely. And car culture, I think contributes to loneliness a lot. Like, I would get lonely a lot in my car. Like if I was in traffic going between Santa Monica and the Hollywood Hills, it's a three hour journey a lot of the times, right? Yeah. And you just sort of spend so much time by yourself in a weird pod and you have to choose to engage with people there instead of just walking to the grocery store and there's people outside. But I think right now what we're going through is certainly an epidemic of loneliness, an epidemic of fear. Um, it's a novel coronavirus and novel is like in every way what we're going through right now. We, you know, p people, I guess, lived through it in the black plague, but they didn't know about news from other places or if anybody else was you know, dealing with it. Um, and we always look at those people in history, like, Oh, poor bastards. They had to live through that. Oh, now we're the poor bastards. All right. We're an experiment. This is a collective global experiment. So my thought was, um, I, I didn't honestly know when to release Planet Nine because in the past two years it was done, but there was no good time because I was fighting so many monsters in the press and having to be tough and strong and scary because I had to scare them to like get back um, and use everything I had to do that. But now I'm sitting here like, it was literally only 10 days ago. I was like, I think I need to release Planet Nine right now because people can't travel outside, but they can travel inside. And I know it's meditative and I know it works. And I, I kind of wish there's another word besides meditation uh, that I could use if that turns people off. But to be honest with you, Mark, I've only meditated twice in my life for five minutes at a time, 20 years apart. That's all I managed. I, I was sitting, I was like, I'm uncomfortable in this position. My brain was like, Wah. I didn't yeah. like it. I know. I, 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 I can relate to that. Some of the, uh, the, the cuts on the song, on, on the album, we're going to play those toward the okay. end of our interview, our time together. Um, you wrote the, the lyrics and the music? No, I didn't do the music. I would kind of hum what, because I don't know how to play instruments. All I can play is my voice, right? Which is an instrument too. But I knew how I wanted it to sound and the rhythm and the flow. And then I was just also lucky enough to work with people that, kind of fundamentally understood what I was trying to do, even if at the time I didn't really entirely understand what I was trying to do. Um, so our music sensibilities and then the lyrics, and they were French, so they didn't really understand the lyrics. They didn't know what I was talking about. And then finally, as we worked together, actually two of them, their English was improving. And by after two years, uh, three years, one of the producers was like, I understand now. Oh, <laughs> uh, like, great. He's and like, this is what we were doing. And your French must, must have improved then too. Google yeah. Translate. Uh, <laughs> it's um, hard. The, um, I think this is music for our time. I think so We too. are all looking for something, for meaning. I mean, you know, thousands of people, potentially millions of people can die right now. We need something to look to, to listen to the lyrics I printed out all of your lyrics. They're beautiful. Oh, wow. Um, Thank you. You know, uh, the, the Now You're Here, uh, uh, the, the, or Origami. Origami is a funny song. It makes me laugh. I have to be honest with you. I'm like, I said a dirty word. <laughs> 
Yes, but you it did. Is. It's <laughs> quite hypnotic. And I wanted, um, I've been to hypnotherapy several times and I found it actually to be great therapy, kind of better than talk therapy for me. It was weird. Um, cause you, I spent 45 minutes talking to this guy, Carrie Gaynor, and then he would kind of put you in this kind of lucid dreaming state. And I would just leave feeling like a million bucks. And I'm like, how can I do it with music? Not to like control people's minds, but to actually unwire it and let them go and travel and, and just feel comfort. And also a lot of people can't meditate or they sit still and they're like, I don't like this. My back hurts or whatever it is. And this, my, it's, I call it prescription music. And one of the reasons is because huh. I mixed it on a 432 hertz frequency. Most music is mixed on 440. And that's what they right. use for radio frequencies. The Nazis also use that. They didn't create it, but they used it. And what that does when you listen to radio, let's say you get in an Uber and it's just kind of like, uh, it's kind of like uh, often I feel it's a, a little assaultive on my head and I can't think, right? With a lot of music, I'm like, it's just the music and I don't have time for free range chicken thoughts. But, um, <laughs> and I think they do it on the 440 with pop music on the radio. So when they go to commercials, your brain relaxes and it's trying to program you to want to listen to it because they play that on a different frequency. And I just think that's bunk. Um, why don't we do it on a 432? There's no proof that it works, but there is a lot of uh, people in the music community that, and, that say it like, kind of helps your brain kind of, it almost massages the left and the right brain. And trauma receptors are all located kind of in the same place. And when your trauma gets triggered, it's as if it just happened to you, right? And so I didn't know how to process my trauma, but I knew I could make beauty and I knew if it helped me, it would help others. And I think it will. It's, I mean, the time is, I think, is, is perfect about Planet Nine. Uh, do you go back to, to Planet Nine, your Planet Nine from when you were a kid? I did. Uh, and, and, and visit there? Because to me, that might be a form of meditation. It is a form of meditation. And I didn't realize that that's what I was doing, you know, um, when I was 10. I didn't realize that by going to a place where nobody's planted a flag and said, these are my borders, do not cross. So I could go anywhere in my mind and with my spirit, right? And to be honest, my music, I listen to it and I use it as a tool when I don't feel good, when I'm stressed or when I'm scared, or just when I want to feel free and happy, I play it. And the first time I tell people when you first listen to it, the best way to do it is to lay on your back, listen at night, maybe with headphones, uh, so you can hear all the pinpoint detail sound and just shut your eyes and let go. After that, you can dance to it. You can do whatever you want. But the first time, and I call it, kind of call it prescription medicine music, because I think it really works to just, and like your wife likes guided meditation. Right. Right. Um, this is kind of, it's kind of like soul guidance, but not with any, like you have to do this or be a better human or do anything like this, but it's just like, it's communicating effectively in a different way, I think. And, and I also use, because I don't know how to paint like my father, but I did, and how, when I wrote my book, I'd never written a book. I'd written one article that was a joke article for a magazine. I was like, how the hell do I do this? Now I said I would do it and I got myself in a pickle. Oh dear. So I, and I approached my lyric writing the same way as if I were painting with words. Wow. The, the, the lyrics are really nice. Uh, I mean, they, they touch you. And is that what you wanted to do? In other words, you know, some people, I'll give you an example. Um, I'm an amateur chef. Okay. And if I'm cooking, I cook for me. I get a lot of criticism from, you know, my wife or my kids, too much garlic, not enough garlic, whatever. But if I like it, I'm cooking for me. Are you writing for yourself or are you writing for others or a combination? That's a great question. That's a really great question. You're like my sister. My sister gives presents and I'm like, Ava, I don't like weird insects, but you gave me some crazy insect that's pinned to, you know, inside of a, a glass case. But um, she gives presents that she likes, right? And maybe makes food that she likes. I come from Hollywood and this, this one thing always stuck in my head about how they measured fan bases before the internet. And that was through the metric they used, not sophisticated, but it was basically they, during the studio system days, if, a, if an actor or director or somebody got one fan letter, that would equal 5,000 fans. So the way I created Planet Nine and the way I thought, well, I think if it appeals to me, it'll appeal to others, because I don't consider myself that terminally unique. 
am I different in a lot of ways? Maybe how I live my life? Sure. But fundamentally, humans elementally are quite similar. And I thought, if I like it, then that must mean 5,000 other people will like it. And each of those 5,000 people, if they like it, will have 5,000 other people. So I kind of did my own test cases and I studied it while I was making it and in the past two years a lot on different groups of people. And I would have them lay down and shut their eyes. I was in Dublin last winter. And I was with my friend Jack. And he and his husband were the first people legally allowed to adopt children uh, because they're gay in Ireland. And they adopted these great twins. And they have, now they have a twin 10-year-olds. And I came over, and the fireplace was going. And it was beautiful. And they had a friend over, the little kids. So it was three 10-year-olds. And Jack, I told him about how it can make you feel and what it can do for you. And he said, I'd like to try it on the children. I was like, oh, wow, I never thought of that. So you had the children lay on their backs in front of the, you know, laying in front of the fire. We turned the lights off. There's just this flickering light. They shut their eyes. It was 38 minutes long. The album was quite short. And the kids stayed perfectly still the whole time. And afterwards, I, we sat for about a minute. So they didn't talk immediately. They were all kind of like in this kind of state. And Jack asked them how it made them feel. And he's brilliant because that wouldn't have occurred to me to tell you the truth. I would have said, did you like it? He said, right. how did it make you feel? And I learned a lot from that. And, and one of the children said home, one of them said safe, and one of them said free. And I was like, I, I, like that's the only review I want to use for my album. Three 10-year-olds, safe, home, and free. I love it. From, that's incredible. And I, then I, I tested it on a group of 85-year-olds in Italy last summer uh, who didn't really speak English that well. And they were like... They came out of it, you know, we were under the stars laying on Shay's mm -hmm. lounges at night and it was just, it was really magical. And they were all, you know, they had an experience. They had an internal experience. And it's beautiful to be able to help people that way. And that's, that's the thing. That's another thing about the coronavirus. We turn on the TV, we see thousands of cars in line for free food. And you know, people that are, were trying to get out of the poverty cycle are now falling back in. The financial aspect of this is going to kill more people in a lot of ways than the coronavirus as well. Yeah, you know, it's, it, it's, 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 it's all epic. kind of, it's, so, it, it is. Right. And you feel impotent also. You're like, how can I help? What can I do? I mean, I've sent money to a domestic violence shelter and putting up four women and four little girls right now, you know, at least for this month, because that's what I could do. But bigger than that, I wrote my book, Brave, to help people. And the same thing with the album. And I thought right now we can all use a little help and it's what I can do. It's what I can contribute. It's one, one thing when you write about, you know, your personal life and the, the sexploitation of, of Weinstein and all that. I mean, coming out and, 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 and saying this is just amazing. Last night we watched the, the, uh, the final episode of Will and Grace. And the second hour to me is more important than the first because of the impact it had on thousands and thousands of people watching this and saying, hey, it's okay to be gay. Yeah. Right? It's okay to be okay. different. It's just okay. It's okay. And, and that's my message too. Like people have yelled at me, thrown things at me, tried to run me over farmer shot me with rock salt like i was t like really quite tortured uh, by a lot of rednecks that were around me at the time and then others and then honestly like northern liberals like they're quite feisty too in their own way and they don't like different they don't and i i think what if and i've had a lot of people like say like are you on drugs you're weird you talk strange and i'm like no i just have thoughts that might be slightly different than yours but I bet you deep down, you have these same thoughts. You're just not allowing yourself. And I think honestly, if more people were like the weirdos, if more people were like, yeah, maybe I am weird to you, but maybe you're weird because you're hiding from yourself and you're staying in the 90%. Wouldn't you want to be free? And I always think like, honestly, I'm a pretty fun person. And I think I've got a pretty strong moral compass. And so when people yell at me, I think maybe you would be better off if you were more like me. Well, yeah. More like why, anybody. Would, why would anybody yell at Rose McGowan? That doesn't make sense to me. Darling, um, if you know how many people have yelled at me <laughs> on Twitter, I was like, oh. Because of your thoughts, your ideas? Yeah. And you know, I had to get to a point where I realized I was sitting at home like six years ago, right before I like, started writing my book. 
I was like, society's had an awful lot of thoughts for me. They've told me on mass, on every medium, fan letters or hate letters, hate websites devoted to how fat I was, what? Um, horrible things, like relentlessly horrible. And I was like, literally like, what is so fun about being famous? This sucks. And then, um, cause I was discovered, so I was never trying to be. So I, I didn't have that hole in my chest that needed to be filled by recognition. In fact, I find it usually kind of embarrassing. But I kind of got to a point where I was like, okay, I've dealt with society's thoughts on me for a very long time. I've got some thoughts for them. Buckle and, you up. Did, and you did it, Planet Nine. And I did. A, a couple of minutes left. Uh, uh, what's your next project? Film, you're gonna act, you're gonna direct, you're gonna write? I, gonna... I did direct a movie called Dawn. And right. if you Google D-A-W-N plus my name on Vimeo, you can see it, it's the only place it's on right now. And um, I knew that after kind of coming at the head of power of Hollywood that I was going to be persona non grata even more than I was before. So acting is kind of off the table. It's even if I wanted to, which I really don't, uh, no one's going to hire me because they don't do that. They're not brave there. It's not, it's not a brave place, right? And uh, which is a shame because so many of the actresses who, whose not careers he stole were fantastic. Like Annabella Sciorra, incredible actor. Mira Servino, incredible actor. And it's really, and so many more that we don't know about, but he's robbed the public. He's robbed them of their art and me too. But I think, cause I was never in love with it. It was my job, but directing, I adore. I have a project um, that I, a screenplay that I commissioned off. I was writing 30 pages of it and I started going too dark and I wanted it to be G rated. And I had this rescue Pomeranian. When I rescued her, I didn't know she was a Pomeranian. She had no fur. And then when she grew into a Pomeranian, I was like, oh, no, it's the worst personality of a dog ever. Ah, no. So I had the meanest Pomeranian that ever lived. I swear to God, she was so mean. Huh. And I hated me. And I was like, I rescued you. Aren't rescues supposed to be grateful? This is not the case. So anyway, she hid in the closet all the time. Huh. Uh, well, first I, I was with my ex-partner, and she would sit on his head or next to him like, lick his lips and stare at me over her shoulders and sleep on his pillow. And so when we broke up, I was like, sweet, she'll sleep on my pillow. No, she moved to the closet where she would spend all day and all night except for food. So I started thinking about what does this Pomeranian do in her closet all day long? So I came up with an invented kingdom called Pomerania. And so it's about this little Pomeranian that is weak in this world. But once she goes into her closet, she's the queen of Pomerania. And the, the Queen of Pomerania is at war with Mutlandia. So the whole thing is G-rated, but so funny and smart. And the whole thing goes between like street savvy, street smart, uh, Sam the lover is the main character, the love interest who's a mutt. And he meets Princess Honeydew, a Pomeranian who's hiding out from being forced to marry Sir Old Man, Old Timer. So she's hiding out in the forest, practicing her nunchuck skills. She beats up the mutt because they're never, the purebreds and the mutts are never supposed to interact. And they're warring. There's even a band of Che Guevara outsider Pomeranians that have like missing limbs and eyes that live in the forest to fight, you know. So it's this whole world and it's, it's really great and funny, but I was going too dark with it. So I hired this other writer who has someone, he's Dominican, and he had to go see his uh, kind of witch doctor person before he was allowed to take on the screenplay, but luckily oh she passed. <laughs> she said it was good so he did it and he turned it in an incredible script I don't know how to get in touch with animators I don't know that side of that that world but this is what I hope to do with this film because it's it's really about race breed class the power structure all this but told to, in a way that the adults would love and the kids will love and and the kids so will learn right yeah, my favorite character is Leche. She's a mutt in Muttlandia, and she's always nursing her puppies in public, so the cops. She's always running away from cops with all these little puppies nursing on her. Stuff oh, like that, it. you know? And it's a way to just really unwire people's brains. Be like, oh, I can see that a little bit differently now. Oh, but we can do it with great... You know, Hollywood, what we do matters. Um, it affects people's minds. And when Absolutely. people sit down to watch TV and film, their brain is open. You're imprinting. The very last screenplay I got sent to, for acting, the woman had a laundry basket in every scene. But she never did laundry. I was like, what are you putting into people's consciousness that women just do laundry all the time? I've seen men do laundry too. We just don't see it. Stuff like that. Right. 
Hey Rose, it's I, I know you're you're uh, you you need to take off, but I really enjoyed our time together. Any? Uh, I really did too. I, thank you. And uh, if you want to come back, just let me know. Let's listen to some samples of the cuts from Rose McGowan's new album, Planet Nine. Shit, baby. 